Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can help in multiple ways. You can subscribe to oxum.substack.com. You can join the YouTube channel directly, or you can give at patreon.com slash oxum. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash A-K-S-U-M. We have a returning guest today, Cantor Daniel. How are you doing today? Doing well, thank God. How are you? I'm doing well, thank God. Um, today we want to talk a little bit about multipolarity, but I'm always just interested in keeping evergreen topics like what we're going to talk about, although it's somewhat topical, and then things that are more topical. Uh, could you say anything about the celebration of uh, Pentecost that just happened or the fast of the apostles. I'm always fascinated by how much is similar with the Coptic church and the Ethiopian church. Of course, one church, let's just say uh, different branches of the Miaphysite church uh, in different countries. Now we're in North America. Absolutely. I'm sure that there's a lot of similarities and um, a lot of the same origins. So uh, we celebrated Pentecost on Sunday and we had, uh, we're, we're still on the old calendar, uh, like I believe you guys are. And um, we had one of our auxiliary bishops, uh, Bishop Suriel, come and visit. Amazing. He's an author. I've met him before mm -hmm. at uh, Holy Resurrection Parish, which is an American Coptic parish in Los Angeles. Nice, nice. Yeah, he is, he is a very tall Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a foot taller than me, and I'm taller than Bishop Carrillo, so... <laughs> Uh, but very sweet guy, uh, speaks with a mixed Australian Egyptian accent, uh, gave a, he gave a wonderful sermon on Pentecost being this time when the spirit goes to all the corners of the earth and how we should preach to all the nations and, and not just focus on our own ethnicity. And, and he praised our parish for having a lot of non-Egyptians in it. Yeah, did he wink at you? <laughs> so we have, you know, we have a procession um, around the church during the Pentecost feast with the resurrection icon and the Pentecost icon. So for most of the of the holy fifty days, we have a procession with the uh, resurrection icon, but then on Pentecost we process both around the church and. We have special hymns, like one called uh, Also Men, that we sing specifically just on Pentecost. Let us praise the Lord, for he with glory is glorified. He ascended to the heavens and gave to us the paraclete, the spirit of truth, the comforter. So um, we have that special hymn. And... We also take the third hour prayer of the Agbeya, which is filled with references to the Spirit and to the coming upon the apostles of the Spirit. And we, instead of praying it before the liturgy like we usually do, we pray it during the liturgy. Nice. And you pray that every Sunday or beforehand? Or is it like something that's just... Like it's in the Agpeya app, but not necessarily each parish does it. We pray the third and sixth hours of the Agbeya every Sunday seasonally. We will also sometimes pray the uh, ninth and eleventh hours, and but at least all, always the third and sixth hours. But what we do, except for the day of Pentecost, that one day of the year, is we pray the third hour along with the sixth hour before the prothesis before the choosing of the lamb um and as sort of the introduction so those are our morning prayers that will be about half an hour nice yeah i have a great translation of the akpeya in amharic by some faithful parishioner from the dc the dc area and for those of you who don't know in case we got a little too technical for you all there that's the liturgy of the hours sometimes called the the breviary i'm actually working on a version there are many many versions in ethiopia it's crazy there are like five or six versions and um including the egyptian one that um uh, that we have manuscripts of but it's not really in use and um 
within that actually just finished about a 30 page excerpt which is uh, I, I believe new scholarly ground I, I will stand corrected if i'm wrong but uh, the first copy of the ethiopic or is diatessaron or smashed up gospels Ooh. that have ever seen and been throwing it around a few publishers trying to see if uh anyone wants to publish that bad boy but uh if not you know i love being independent so this was actually a great intro introduction we we are kind of similar um we we didn't have a procession today uh, i i feel like we could have but we we um typically on the holidays of the lord for whatever reason there aren't really processions the one quasi exception is the baptism or theophany or epiphany where the tabernacles of multiple parishes will meet at an offsite for us it's dodger stadium in los angeles in the parking lot at dodger stadium and it'll like move locations so the, there's like a procession from your home parish to all these parishes linking up and then you're under these large tents as if you're in the in the in the tent of the wilderness of the lord a oh, reminder wow. of the kind of universality of god but in terms of um, more monthly holidays and year and other biannual holidays that are not of the lord there's often a kind of very circular procession that goes on so yeah it's um and, and, and we will take the the gospel of john and the cross the processional cross around during like holidays of the lord but the actual tabernacle even when it's like the tabernacle assigned to the lord usually doesn't process <laughs> even though that's the the job of the holy spirit is to proceed from the father and not from the son but <laughs> um we have a hymn that is similar to what you said the holy spirit descended upon the apostles in the form of a blazing flame or a fire or flame or something like that but the rest of the hymnography is actually virtually the same throughout the paschal season it's the it's mm. the pascha or the fasica the the Easter or the resurrection hymnography every day for uh, throughout the 50 days. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is repeated on Pentecost, but now we're in the, in the fast of apostles. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting that it actually segues into what we're going to talk about. And I wonder if that was what inspired you, but you reached out recently and wanted to talk about um, polarity. So can you talk about what polarity is and in general and explain, um, you, I think it's uni, I don't know if it's mola, <laughs> mono, uh, but uh, unipolarity, let's say bipolarity and multipolarity. And then we could kind of shift into what was the, the setting of the early church. Because I, I find often in American Christianity, so deeply uh, steeped is the belief in the separation of church and state that it, it's hard to even comprehend the ways in which they've been intertwined since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, and and I decided, you know, before I guess until pretty recently, I thought that perhaps I should just avoid even talking about these things. But I've started to think more and more. It is important for us as Christians to grapple with these things and to think through them and to come up with reasoned really christian approaches not and i'm not talking about your typical american christian approach which has very little to do with how the church would have seen it for most of history and has more to do with confusing nationalism american nationalism with christianity um of course you know in the in the ancient world the whole world was not connected. You wouldn't even necessarily be aware of the existence of countries that were, say, a few thousand miles away. Although, on the other hand, we do need to realize that there was actually much more widespread trade between countries that were very far apart than we usually think. So there's been Middle Eastern items found in Scandinavia, for example things like that, where it's like, okay, you know what, people were actually moving around more than we think. But still, there wasn't as much communication and as much interaction, especially not direct inter interaction. It was through emissaries. So originally, you had 
extreme multipolarity. And a strong country or a strong city state even would hold sway over a portion of the world, over the region of the world that it was in. And things began to change when, uh, during the colonial era, when these, and, and it's important to note that it was Western European countries. Eastern Europe is a different story. Um, yes, there was the Russian Empire, but the Russian Empire was taking over North, far North Asia and Eastern Europe. It was not going and taking over Africa and South America and all of these places, nor was Poland or any of the countries that were absorbed into the German and Austro-Hungarian empires involved in this, in these foreign exploits. Germany was, um, it would have been to a far greater degree if it could have, but Germany was restricted by its geographical location from actually going and participating in the early parts of colonialism, but it did eventually snatch up places like Namibia. And in fact, one of the original uh, times that we tried, that we in America tried to incorporate Greenland into the United States would have involved a multi-part trade between Denmark, Germany, and America. Denmark gives Greenland to America. America gives Mindanao to Germany. Germany gives whole, whole pardon my pronounce, my probable mispronunciation here, but Holzweg Schlesstein, the northern, I'm, I'm sure I'm slaughtering that, the northern, whole well, part of northern Germany that borders Denmark to Denmark. Uh, so it was kind of a proposed three way trade off. But anyway, the French and the Spanish and the English and the Portuguese and the Dutch. So all of these Western European countries, and note that those are both Catholic and Protestant countries, started snatching up and colonizing land and basically just claiming it for themselves because their weapons were superior. And I mean, there was nothing Christian or, or morally acceptable about what they did. They stole other people's lands. They badgered and forced nations, even China, into uh, submitting to their imperialistic wills and stole their resources. And areas like Africa and Latin America are still suffering from the theft of resources uh, that, that those countries committed. And they committed genocide too. They committed many genocides. So, but one thing that they did was they started making the world smaller in a sense, because now you have these huge empires that were controlling big swaths of land. And so there was a certain degree of multipolarity at that point. Now you had a few dominant countries. You had some countries that remained independent, uh, some that were eventually absorbed, like India was eventually absorbed into the British Empire. Iran that kept and Thailand kept fighting off the invaders, the imperialists. Japan just shut itself out for a couple hundred years during the Tokugawa era. But what you had was you had a multipolar world, and that was mostly dominated by these huge Western European powers. Um, and during that time of imperialism is when industrialism got going. And so they had even more technology and began to fight among each other, make agreements among each other, etc. And things like the creation of the United States were a part of that milieu. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of discontent people moved to the States and they wanted independence. But on the other hand, there were a lot of people living in the United, in the colonies, in the American colonies, who were very content with British rule. Many who fled to Canada or to Britain um, 
during and after the Revolutionary War. The Loyalists, yeah, including the Black ancestor of Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Oh, that's interesting. He, he was one of the he was one of the black loyalists that went to Nova Scotia. That is cool, and and one of uh, Winston Churchill's ancestors. So Winston Churchill nice. actually had some Native American ancestry. Wow. More than just... Elizabeth Warren. Probably more than Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have more Native American ancestry, <laughs> and I would refrain from calling myself Native American. <laughs> yeah, Joe Hogan measured uh, his DNA, and uh, being that he has quite a bit of uh, Southern Italian ancestry, although it's exaggerated how African they are, he ended up being, even he's a quarter Irish and like seven, uh, 75% or three-fourths Italian, and a large swath of that Southern Italian, he's 1% African. And I think uh, Elizabeth Warren was 1% of 1%, so he was, oh, in fact a hundred times blacker than she was a native american uh of course the i think the particular tribe she was claiming was insulted because they don't believe in dna tests in the first place which they viewed as a european mechanism and if they accept you they accept you if they don't accept you they don't accept you not based off of blood but off of merit right so they probably would have just said why didn't you just ask yeah like, like i think jordan peterson is some honorary member of uh, one of the First Nations tribes in Canada, just because mm -hmm. of either sort of some sort of research or communication he's done with them. And I'm sure he doesn't have any blood in him. See, we have we have evidence that one of my great great grandparents was Native American. But or actually, the great great grandparent would have been half Native American, it would have been the, the full Native American would have been great 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 grandmother. From Probably Louisiana, but we're not sure. It's fuzzy. Um, it's fuzzy. So I don't know. I have a picture of my great great grandmother, and she sure looks like a lot of the modern Choctaws, but I don't know. It's interesting history, though. Oddly enough, I'm one of the, like, less than 1% of humans who doesn't have a sub-Saharan African genetic marker. Wow. I don't know why. Um, my mom does, so it fell off with me for some reason. <laughs> but it, ha it, ha it happens, but yeah, you know, you're talking about Greenland earlier. I think Trump made some attempt with a some threat of building a, a Trump Tower there or something to that effect as well. You kind of started in the 14 and 1500s, which is, uh, it's yeah. good to the present day, mm -hmm. speaking about multipolarity or having different powers controlling different parts of the globe. I think you were leading up to the bipolarity and then the single polarity and then the, uh, the breaking up of that. But then after That's that, true. we can pull a Tarantino. And I want to say a little bit about the uh, environment of the, the early church because long before uh i love the russians but uh long before they were orthodox uh for about 600 years before <laughs> uh we had some christianity and uh, there was a, a global scene at that time that was also multipolar my my polish ancestors were also worshiping perun and <laughs> all of those uh slavic interesting 80s. slavic yeah god's road and um so World War One is important, and yes. it, it sometimes you know gets overshadowed in our interest with World War Two, but no World War One, no World War Two. Yes. So what happened in World War One fundamentally changed the psyches of a lot of Europe and the way that a lot of people thought. And we have to recognize we here in America think white, black, Hispanic. There's not very many people in Europe who go, oh, that person in that other European country is white too. So I can identify with them. They're very regional in their identifications. <laughs> and sometimes like, specific groups. So they fought for centuries among themselves, killed each other off at various times. World War I was a 
terrible war that killed massive amounts of people, that the great European powers not only dragged their uh, the their European uh, like European national nationalities like the Czechs got dragged into this war. The Poles got dragged into the war on different sides because we were split between the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the German Empire. And they also, the, the great European powers also dragged people from their colonies in Africa and Asia into the war. It was a terrible war. People talk about it as sleepwalking into war. But for years before the war, there was massive armor buildup. They were moving troops toward the border. Multiple great powers did things that they positively should have known would have led to war. So it wasn't really sleepwalking into war. And World War I redesigned everything. So the Germans got blamed for absolutely everything. And certainly the Germans had committed a lot of atrocities. And the Germans were the bad guys, so I'm not justifying them there. But... I I'm not so sure, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> In World War One, In World War Two is a different story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, what... What about the Austro-Hungarians? But I guess they kind of got off the hook because their whole empire just shattered into a hundred pieces. Yeah. Um, in what's important to notice, and it ties into what's going on today, and this reemergence that we are seeing right now, right in front of our eyes, of multipolarity in this world is the Russian Civil War. And it's not a very simple thing. It was a very complex event. Um, I'm honest... Before you get into that event, could you talk about the transition from multipolarity to bipolarity and then the Russian situation? I think that sets it up. Because would, would you, or do you think it went straight from multipolar to unipolar? Because I view a little moment oh, of uh, bipolarity. No, no. I do think it went to bipolarity, but more like after World War II. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the Russian Civil War in the, um, after World War One, after they pulled out of World War One, was very complex situation. It was more complex than just like, okay, the Bolsheviks took over from the czar. Oh, you're talking about the Bolsheviks. Sorry, I thought you meant the one going on right now. Oh, yeah. No, no. Got like you. The, got you. I got the, you. 1917. Got yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Till like 1921. So you actually had quite a few groups involved. I'm pretty impressed that the territory of the Russian Empire, for the most part, stayed together. That's pretty impressive. Um, Because <laughs> it could have so easily fallen apart. So the Tsar had to abdicate. There was a more moderate government that took over from the Tsar. Uh, but they eventually fell too. Now, one of the factors in this is that there were, uh, there were workers' councils that had taken over in many parts of Russia. When the Bolsheviks came in, they infiltrated those councils. When they had taken over, they got rid of their erstwhile allies. And the Bolsheviks um, changed not just socialist doctrine in general, but they changed Marxist doctrine as well. Um, now, Marx had said... And this is obviously problematic, but Marx had said what would you need is a dictatorship of the proletariat as sort of an interim to communism, to get you to communism. And the vanguard. Mm -hmm. Mikhail Buchanan 
pointed out, if you do that, they're never going to give up power. He said you simply have to get rid of the state to get rid of tyranny. Because it doesn't matter what ideology a state claims. States aren't going to give up power. And we see that in the history of the Soviet Union, where they kept saying, a few years and we'll have communism, a few years and we'll have communism, a few years and we'll have communism. They never did. The state controlled all the industries. So the Lenin changed the doctrine a little bit to say that you don't need a dictatorship of the proletariat. What you need is a dictatorship of a special revolutionary class, special class of, of um, professional revolutionaries. And so this is the group that eventually took over. Now, there was another group involved, which was called the Black Guards. And they were very active in Russia. They were active in the Ukraine. And they were more or less represented in large swaths of area around the Urals and Siberia, where during the Russian Civil War, when there were huge gaps, huge gaps of who was in power, there were huge areas in the former Russian Empire that simply organized themselves into regional workers' councils. So kind of regional, libertarian, in the old sense of the word, councils. And then eventually either the Tsarists or the Bolsheviks or both came in and took away that burgeoning freedom. The Bolsheviks also not only suppressed their fairly amenable allies in the socialist parties, but they also suppressed the Black Guard, the libertarians or anarchists. And um, the Black Guard did not help themselves. They uh, bombed the, uh, the Soviet parliament. And when they did so, they killed one of the guys who was actually sympathetic to them. Awesome. Um, that doesn't help. <laughs> Um, now, the Ukraine is an interesting story. So people don't understand the history of the Ukraine. This is a very complex region, and it can't be simplified. And I think a lot of people just want a simplistic answer on it. But And, and note that I am not supporting any war or any violent movement. I'm not... I don't support wars. I don't support states. I'm not... Um, I'm not saying that anybody's acceptable. Um, You're making descriptive claims. It sounds more than normative ones. You're ta talking about the situation as it is, not as you wished or hoped it would be. For sure. Yes. Yes. So I'm just describing this is what happened to show that that we we really need to take seriously this is a very complex region with a very complex history and not just 100% support one side or 100% support another and ignore the very real internal conflicts that are going on in that region and the very real human beings on both sides. So you had a group that was for Ukrainian independence now, note that Germany had actually set up an independent Ukrainian state before they lost World War I. They won the war on the Eastern Front and took a huge swath of the territory that was under Bolshevik control, or mostly Bolshevik control. Official Bolshevik control, that's who they talked with for the, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. At the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, they took all this territory, and they had set up an independent Ukrainian state. But then they lost the war on the Western Front and ultimately the whole war. And so you had this group that wanted to set up an independent Ukrainian state. You had pro-Tsarists 
the White Guard, White Army, that moved in to the Ukraine. You had parts of what is now the Ukraine that were part of Poland after World War I. Poland was further to the east, and it was half of what's now Belarus and Ukraine. Wow. Lvov was a Polish city. That I had heard World recently. Yeah. And so you had huge swaths of what's now the Ukraine that were simply uh, predominantly Polish and some Germans living there, or some Belarusians living there, and a lot of Jews. On a brief linguistic note, do you know, were they speaking Polish or were they speaking a different language at that time when they were in the Poles were speaking Polish. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were living there. Most of the Poles that uh, were living in Eastern Poland, what's now Western Ukraine, moved, were moved into Poland after World War II. And there was a portion of what was Germany that was given to Poland. Poles were moved in there and Germans were moved into Germany further to the west so there was a movement of people way over to the west of a lot of people and you know i i believe that the jews were speaking yiddish and but there were some ethnic ukrainians as far as i know and there's also the region of galicia Volinia that we have to take into account which mm-hmm. is south eastern corner of poland north western corner of ukraine that's the region that my ancestors come from on the polish side and that region has its own very varied history at one time galicia Volinia was its own kingdom and so you not only have poles living there you also at times had cossacks you had um Greeks coming through there. You had Armenians who settled there in the 1200s to 1400s. And the uh, you you also had you have Bolsheviks. So you have Bolsheviks. You have the Red Army in part of Ukraine fighting for the Ukraine. You had the Ukrainian independence movement. You have parts of what's now the Ukraine that were Poland and Belarus, and you also had the Black Guard. And the Black Guard was this uh, libertarian socialist army that took over a portion of what's now over in eastern Ukraine, right over where a lot of that fighting is going on right now, and set up their own territory. Now, this little region where the Black Guard was had a very interesting history. It was had been settled by multiple ethnicities, Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, etc. Germans, I believe, too. Some Germans had settled there. But they had all become Russified. So they were of multiple ethnic backgrounds, but they had all begun to have Russian culture, speak the Russian language, etc., and think of themselves as Russians. And there were also a lot of Russians living in what is now the Ukraine. So these various groups were fighting each other. And there were times when the Tsarists had the same purpose as the Bolsheviks. Well, Usually to suppress the libertarian socialists or to suppress the Ukrainian nationalists. But then, of course, they would fight each other. So eventually, you know, the USSR won. The Bolsheviks took over. The Bolsheviks imposed on the USSR their dominance, their government, that was not Soviet or socialist or republican, but they called themselves the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And when Stalin, who was a Georgian, took over... Allegedly. (laughs) Allegedly. Yeah, I think so, too. (laughs) (laughs) A a Russified one, as you've said, right? Or would would you say that he was like... 
I don't know, was he bad at speaking Russian or something? Was he like overly like country? Like, was he a country bumpkin Georgian or was he like um, totally assimilated? You know, no, I mean, as far as I know, and I'm, I, I would say go to Stephen Kotkin for the, the for sure details, but my understanding is that he spent enough time with Russians that he knew Russian, but he still spoke Georgian. And he was still put people like Beria in his inner circle, who was a Georgian. But they, he spoke Russian. He knew Russian. And it's my understanding that a lot of, of the Russian empire, they were taught, sometimes unwillingly, the Russian language, just like in the Soviet Union. But I could be mistaken on some of those points. So go to Stephen Kotkin. Yeah, I wonder it in the context of the contemporary war. Mm -hmm. I have heard accounts that Zelensky, for example, the head mm -hmm. of the Ukraine, is better, he's a Jewish background, better at speaking because he assimilated into the Russian culture and because of the particular generation he's in. He's better at speaking Russian than the Ukrainian dialect and that he's been taking like Ukrainian dialect lessons which is kind of like a crazy wow. geopolitical linguistic thing. And I'm wondering like, you know, did Stalin need like a Russian tutor or something? Or was he like confident? I mean, I don't know. No, I don't think he did. I believe that he did speak Russian fluently. Um, and, and of course, you know, during the Soviet Union, a lot of people were forced to speak Russian and a lot of native languages were either suppressed or you had to basically speak it as your second language in a lot of areas. And the, uh, the, the, the Black Guard was suppressed. The czarists were driven out. A lot of the czarists went to France. So did a lot of the, of the libertarian socialists. And the czarists that went to France produced a lot of the great fathers that later mm -hmm. came to America, right? It's like Lotsky and uh -huh. Schmemann. And, and I don't know if Hopko's family is from there, but I believe so. I'm not sure about Hopko, but yeah, I know Lasky and, and Schmemann for sure. Um, and I think Florovsky. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, they, they went to France. And a lot of the other revolutionaries went to France. So it was it was not certain at the time that the that the Russian Civil War started that the Bolsheviks would actually win. It wasn't certain that even it wouldn't just disintegrate into a hundred pieces. But anyway, the out of World War One came World War Two. So the Germans felt like they had been handed the short end of the stick, and they probably were. And that produces a lot of resentment and a lot of anger. And that doesn't mean that it was all one way of thinking. What was kind of more pro-monarchy, nationalist, was very much in Bavaria. But if you look at the Rhineland, there was a lot of anti-fascist, libertarian socialist sentiment, people trying to make worker, workers' councils, people resisting the rise of the Nazis in the Rhineland which was the industrial heart of Germany. Even people hyper-conservative, like I've been hearing a lot of people talk a lot about Ernst Jünger lately, and I've been reading a lot of his quotes. I haven't tackled any of his books yet, but Ernst Jünger, one of these kind of traditionalist, hyper-conservatives, old guard of Germany, who critiqued the Nazis as well from the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They managed to get power, and World War II happened. So during World War II, when the Germans invaded the Ukraine, what reappears? The Ukrainian Independence Army. So the Germans invade the Soviet Union, and a lot of these people who just 
30 years ago, they or their fathers were involved in the Ukrainian Independence Army, or a lot of people who had gone through uh, Holodomor, which was the starving of the Ukraine under Stalin, when millions died, he cut off the breadbasket of the Soviet Union and just killed all these people. It was insane. And it was evil. But this Ukrainian independence army re-arises and tries to take advantage of the situation of the Germans and the Soviets fighting to simply say, hey, we're just going to start our own state again and go, and go our own way. So you had these people who were simply nationalists. They were not pro-Soviet, for sure. And they were also not pro-German. They were simply Ukrainians. That's how they thought of themselves. And they spoke Ukrainian, and they had Ukrainian culture, and they just wanted to be Ukraine. But then you had a very large number of people, of Ukrainians, who sided with the Nazis. And virulently so. It was as bad as the French collaboration with the Nazis. So I'm not saying all the Ukrainians sided with the Nazis any more than all of the French. But there was this serious segment that actually joined the Nazis, joined the SS, many of them joined the SS, fought for the Germans, and not only that, but committed genocides of Jews, of Poles, of Soviet soldiers, of Ukrainians who didn't agree with them. And they had certain emblems. And guess what? They reappear <laughs> in history. All these groups reappear in history. But then when you get to the eastern Ukraine, you have a lot of people who are either ethnically simply Russian or are Russified. And so they tended to side with the Soviet Union, but not all of them. There were some Russians who fought for the Germans. As bizarre as that sounds. I mean, even Ukrainians fighting for Germans is pretty bizarre because they considered them to not be fully Aryan and human. They were a, a subordinate, a inferior race to the Nazis. Part Asiatic or something like that. I hear some of that talk nowadays, even of the Ukrainians speaking of the Russians. Oi. And see, that's just the reemergence of this group, of this one factor, this one segment that has those Nazi sympathies. And, and again, that's where we have to be careful to not just say, you know, none of the Ukrainians are Nazis or all of the Ukrainians are Nazis. <laughs> like, uh, it's complicated. So, and, and people don't want it to be complicated. A non-insignificant amount. Yeah. Are definitely in support, are definitely neo-Nazis right now. So we have to recognize that. And we have to recognize that that just because the American imperialists, whether neoconservative or neoliberal, say something, you shouldn't just go along with their propaganda. And most of America today is divided between the people who go along with whatever the neoconservative propaganda is or with whatever the neoliberal propaganda is. And the neoconservative propaganda and the neoliberal propaganda, I think you'd agree with me, are both horrible and statist, and imperialistic. They're both bad. They're both warmongers. So the... Uh, the Soviet Union, you know, won. Beat the Germans. Took Berlin. And... Re-established their rule over the Ukraine. A lot of the Ukrainians who had sided with the Nazis fled to Canada. And Canada allows to this day for there to be pro-Nazi, pro-SS memorials in Canada. They just kind of get overlooked because they're not German. They're Ukrainians. Well, 
it's still celebrating Nazis. And Canada's apparently okay with that. But anyway. The I haven't Soviet... heard of that. I, I thought they all had fled to Latin America. I've heard especially in Argentina. Oh, yeah. A lot of the Germans did. And the French. The French collaborators. And some of the, one of the, uh, I think he was a Latvian collaborator, ran to Argentina. Or Brazil it was. So, now the Soviet Union has all this power. Germany's been trounced. Italy had its own conflict, its own internal civil war. Japan, that tried to become a late empire, fell apart. America suddenly emerges as dominant. Britain won. Britain was on the winning side, but it was kind of a pirate victory. They fell apart after that. They lost their, their power and their connections, and America took that gap. With Britain kind of as our right-hand man. And so now what you see emerging is America and Russia. Or the Soviet Union. Bipolarity. Mm -hmm. So you see bipolarity emerging. Now here's what's a little scary. What's the free world? Both sides considered themselves the free world. And considered the other to be the enslaved world. The non-free world that needed to be liberated. But what kind of li liberation were either actually offering? Uh, so we became very imperialistic, domineering over Latin America, which we had already been doing in the late 1800s, starting to domineer over Latin America. We left our military in Germany. There's still U.S. military bases in Germany. And uh, in Japan. And Japan. <laughs> Most of our military bases in Japan are in Okinawa, which isn't even ethnically Japanese. And the Okinawans yeah. don't like it. That they're still part of Japan and definitely don't like it that America stuck all its military bases down there for what they see as something that they didn't do. That Japan did. And the Soviet Union sure didn't show that it wanted a free world. So Spanish Civil War. A lot of people think, oh, it was just like the fascists versus the Republicans. But it wasn't. There was another group. The Libertarian Socialists. So the, the Libertarians... And I'm using the old form of the word libertarian, which is the anti-state wing of the socialist movement. Took over a portion of Catalonia. They took over Catalonia. And everything was actually going fine there. Like the industry was doing well. They had reorganized everything into workers' councils. They had abolished private land ownership. I'm not saying that I approve of everything that the Spanish, uh, the Spanish anarchists were doing. The, the church in Spain had become so corrupt and connected to a corrupt, oppressive state that they they did try to get rid of the churches and shut them all down. And obviously I don't approve of that. I understand, you know, that they that the church had become corrupt and connected to the state, but that's kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because where are your morals going to come from? And eventually that's going to break down. If if you're That's going the, the so-called the, the Francoists were the the most pro 
church faction would you say of the bunch and it's interesting fascism mm -hmm. in in spain and portugal is different than in italy and germany in that it's not imperialistic it's insular they almost took like yeah. a switzerland like approach and focused on on their own things i know orwell has a book about mm -hmm. catalonia i haven't read it yeah. he was he was there was he among the libertarian socialist side or the more mainstream communist he seems more libertarian in the old sense that you're talking about the way yeah. he has biting critiques later of uh you know like the bolsheviks mm -hmm. via the pigs and animal farm <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah no he he fought with the libertarian socialist army so um it, it's funny i've seen this this picture of a sign above copies of george orwell's books that that said banned in america for promoting communism banned in the ussr for opposing communism <laughs> yeah i know i know there are hot debates <laughs> between who gets to claim george orwell just like i've seen them about who gets to claim tolkien you know tolkien mm -hmm. called himself both a monarchist and an anarchist and had his explanation of that in a letter to his son christopher and uh i wonder I what hear of that. orwell That's an interesting would say one. Yeah, yeah. What he said is he's an anarchist, not in the twirly mustache and Molotov cocktail throwing way, mm -hmm. but in the general skepticism towards power and authority, kind mm -hmm. of like a, a proclivity towards freedom. But he's a monarchist in the sense he's a, a traditionalist, a conservative in England, being a Catholic, not just a high church Anglican. Yeah. And you would, I guess, you would want to at least be a monarchist if you were already a Catholic in <laughs> that time in England. Oh, yeah. But well, I wonder about Orwell. Like, who who would he identify with, right? And you're mm -hmm. saying, like, <laughs> is he communist or is he capitalist? Like, yeah. are these labels not no. profound enough, nuanced I, enough? I think that he would do what he did in Spain, which is oppose both. He opposed both the Soviet Union. And their uh, their state socialists, pro state socialists, the Republican Army in Spain. Um, note that that is not the same thing as Republican Party in the U.S. Um, but the Republicans Lowercase are Republican. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Lower Republicanism, meaning the idea of having a republic mm -hmm. versus capital R Republican member of the Republican Party in the United States, which itself has obviously gone through changes right the party of donald trump is not the party of abraham lincoln and those parties don't even exist under george washington let alone the articles of confederation yes yes absolutely i mean the modern republican party would be unrecognizable to abraham lincoln and the modern democrat party would be unrecognizable to uh, say uh, jefferson davis <laughs> so or thomas jefferson for that matter yeah yeah for sure you'd be like what what's this group it, and 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 i you know um and and on that point um yeah th these republicans were backed by the soviets and then you had the fascists who were backed by the Germans. Those two sides, like the Soviets and the fascists, kind of collaborated to take down Catalonia and to get rid of the libertarian socialists so that they could then fight each other for control of Spain. And again, like I said, I'm not totally approving of everything that the libertarian socialists in Spain did. I'm not saying that their experiment was everything in the world. But I think the Zapatistas and what they did is a lot better. Or, in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm, in Mexico. In Chiapas. And, and, and I think that, you know... But we have to recognize that people are all people living in their own times, and they're usually trying to do their best. 
but it certainly would have helped if they had had the light of Christ and had had the light to see that, hey, you know, just because the church has been connected to a corrupt government in Spain and just because the fascists are pro-church here in Spain doesn't mean that that's an appropriate expression of Christianity, of historic Christianity, or that you need to feel like, hey, we need, have to get rid of the church and get rid of any signs of Christianity and get rid of the priests. Um, and, and to the degree that they didn't see that, I think that they actually didn't see what the great anarchist leader Mikhail Buchanan was saying when he said, my freedom is connected to everyone else's freedom. He said, if I'm not free, or if everyone else is not free, I'm not really free. So basically, if I get freedom and I say, hey, I have liberty now, but I've done so by taking away the liberty of another, then I'm not really free. And that's exactly what the Bolsheviks and exactly what a lot of these violent revolutionaries have done, is get their personal freedom by taking away other people's freedom. Um, am I rambling? So they, no, 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 it's good. So, yeah, I, I keep hearing you mentioning these cases, and it, it reminds me of this kind of transformation in, in viewing these histories that I've had over the pandemic. And it's that I always grappled with this issue because I like this idyllic, small, decentralized community that mm -hmm. has control over itself always struggled with the question of what happens when a bigger state comes and swoops you and you know it's like philosophically these smaller places there's no reason they can't exist in fact i point to the largest one i think it's james scott from um i think he was at yale the anthropologist the cultural anthropologist he studied the zomians in southeast asia who are various different peoples, the most famous of which are the Hmong, who are en masse in central California, as well as in Minnesota. I lived amongst them when I lived in Merced and in the Turlock area. But they're one of many groups that came out. I have this great book I read on, on the subject in, in law school about cross-cultural negotiation. It's um, it's escaping me now. It's by uh, Anne Fadiman, and it's like, um the spirit catches you and you fall down and it's like the medical journey of this epileptic monk child moving from zomia in southeast asia in a stateless southeast asia to the united states and all the kind of cultural issues and hiccups that that happen when they meet the bureaucracy of the american system when they were very kind of free people so these zomians were slash and burn agriculturalists who were constantly for for hundreds, if not thousands of years, dodging all the major states of China and Thailand and everything else in the area, India, whatever it may be. Um, and there were about 100 million of them in the 20th century. I don't know how many still exist. I imagine there are still some run around in the mountains there. But pretty much as the states expanded, they, uh, they got rid of them all. And a lot of them emigrated to the United States a large swath actually went to Ecuador, Equatorial, uh, actually not Ecuador, Equatorial Guinea. And the ones in Equatorial Guinea have fared much better than the ones in the United States because in Equatorial Guinea, they just gave them a plot of land and said survive. And they were great at that. Whereas here, they're like get incorporated in the system and mm -hmm. that did not work so well for them. Uh, I think to this day, although maybe some of them, uh, if you're Hmong or some other type of Zomian, you could reach out and tell me if the situation's changed. But last i checked a few years ago wasn't wasn't a great situation um was it grand torino the the film um by clint eastwood kind of talks about the somali and the Hmong in minnesota so that's a kind of contemporary example semi-contemporary that was when i was in college so that itself has been maybe a decade old so if you ever watch that movie grand torino you see a little bit of them but what I've come to understand in all of these different historical situations that you talk about is kind of maybe more Machiavellian and realize like, man, if you don't invest in at least 
self-defense militarily mm -hmm. uh, very likely you get wiped from the face of the earth like the Assyrians yeah. like <laughs> the Austro-Hungarians like and I've had a Austro-Hungarian on my podcast before actually um oh cool but to kind of help guide you back and don't worry about rambling this whole podcast mm -hmm. my whole philosophy of art and science I'm, I'm two years into it by the way uh today's june 14th we're recording this june 15th is my two-year anniversary so you're pretty much my anniversary episode and oh, wow. uh i'd say the whole series of my podcasts are a series of ramblings and digressions which hopefully people glean wisdom if not wisdom at least a little humor and joy from so to guide you back we went from the multipolar world if, if i can interject briefly i would say way 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 back in the day in the early church setting the multipolarity that was relevant for the church councils and everything else is you see the Western Roman Empire, Rome, strong mm -hmm. until it falls to the Visigoths and all the other Germanic tribes. You see a shift of power to the what's called Byzantium later, but what self-identified mm -hmm. conquered people who were Romanized, but yeah. they were Greeks. And called uh, themselves Ruth. Called themselves Romans. but they Never called Roman themselves Empire. Byzantium. No. And then you have at the border of them to the east, the um, the Persian Empire, to the north, the kind of Slavic regions we're talking about. I don't know all of the states, but I know that the steppe was very powerful at the time. So I know there were a lot of different, you know, what would be called barbarian tribes and, and kind of nomadic peoples that had a, a lot of ebbs and, and flows in, in terms of who was in charge and not a lot of central states, to my knowledge, until centuries and centuries and centuries later um the greeks of course eventually subsumed by the turks the egyptians were changing hands a lot of time the armenians changing hands a lot of times syrians changing hands a lot of times but a lot of times in the kind of greater zone of the eastern roman empire the ethiopians somehow under the uh, episcopate of the egyptians and the monastic and scriptural and hymnographical influence of the Syrians, but mm -hmm. their own independent state all the way till 1974, outlasting the Roman Empire, by the way, <laughs> uh, out, outlasting the Russian Empire, for that matter, which itself uh, comes much later. And, and perhaps that's because we were, I, I like to say, we're the, the empire at the end of the earth. You know, it's like right. the small, <laughs> it's, it's the small empire. It's not as big as those other empires. And maybe it's it's a. Uh, modesty or humility in, in size and scope which it was humbled by the the sassanian persians to get out of the middle east in the first place and just stay in africa maybe maybe that humbling uh kept it uh, as long as it did until it too fell to the communists who were of course influenced by the bolsheviks but i also believe by the american military who has been shown actually in a recent documentary by the great granddaughter of uh she not she didn't make it but she's a part of it the great granddaughter of Haile Selassie Yeshikasa made the point in a Q&A in a recent uh, documentary about how the the communists got rid of her family and she tied a lot of what happened to her family to the Romanovs of Russia and in fact there's a uh, one of the great grandsons of Haile Selassie just moved to Los Angeles he his marriage was in the New York Times a few years ago and he's also part of the Russian dynasty because uh, I, I don't know how exactly it works. His mother, his aunt, or something, something, something in his direct line, not his aunt. Something in his direct line is a member of the Russian royal family as well. So there are connections even between those houses. But um, wow. the Ethiopian Empire itself felt communism, but the singular polarity or monopolarity or unipolarity, whatever prefix we're using kind of occurs in that period between 1988, 1989 to about 1991 and, and the early 90s, when you see all of the color revolutions, the kind of peaceful revolutions in a lot of the Slavic speaking places when the Iron Curtain falls, the you know, the releasing of Germany and, mm -hmm. and everything else where America becomes the sole power with, as you said, Britain, and you could say yeah. the quote unquote international community at its right hand. So. Yeah, you could jump uh, in there. Yeah, color revolutions, also known as CIA operations to pull countries toward NATO. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you had this bipolar. Oh, and, and to show that, that America was also working in a similar way to the Soviet Union to push toward, uh, to 
suppress actual liberty movements, actual libertarian movements, because there was nothing libertarian or free or even socialist about the Soviet Union. Uh, was it was totalitarian? Oh yeah, yeah. No, it was totally totalitarian. The state controlled the industries, just like in Nazi Germany. Uh, just like in modern China. China isn't communist right now. It's basically fascist. If my understanding of, of the current Chinese setup is correct, it's fascist in the proper sense of the word. Um, the, Meaning kind of like monarchic, like one person, like authoritarian, one person ruling and then commanding the economy. Right. Like selectively, selectively communist and selectively capitalist interventionist right. telling the business owners this is how much you're going to make this is how much you're going to pay this is where your products are going to go this is where you're going to get your products from controlling everything but with the veneer of freedom of some sort of economic freedom but that's not economic freedom so in italy you know the italy actually in during world war ii overthrew mussolini and Mussolini ran away. Hitler tried to reinstate him. Civil war broke out in Italy. But in the midst of all this, up in northern Italy, there were big sections that were uh, because the um, the Nazis and the pro-fascist Italians, if one of their people got killed, would go into the villages and the towns and just shoot random civilians. There were some places where they massacred several dozen civilians. So they would just shoot civilians. And so these civilians are like, well, who are we supposed to join? Like, if I stay here, I might still get killed, even if I'm not doing anything. So a lot of them started joining the Italian anarchists. And the Italian anarchists, the libertarian socialists, um, and, and again, if somebody missed it, there's there's like two branches of socialism, state socialism and anti-state socialism. So the branch that says we have to have some sort of dictatorship, some sort of state in charge uh, in order to implement socialism. And then the branch that says you have to just get rid of the state. You have to cut the head of the beast off or it's just going to keep growing in a different color. <laughs> is Bakunin the kind of main figure of that stateless socialism? Is Trotsky have mm -hmm. anything to do with that? Or is it just Bakunin? Or who is that? No, Trotsky would still be in state socialism. He just had some disagreements on how to further communism. He had some mm -hmm. disagreements with, um, with Stalin. And... Also, Stalin so, just wanted Kropot total power. Kropotkin would be another one, maybe. Mm -hmm. Peter Kropotkin, another one like Bakunin. Yeah, Mikhail Buchanan, Peter Kropotkin. Uh, today, you would have someone like Noam Chomsky. And yeah. that's historically what the term libertarian has meant. Um, and kind of my critique of American libertarianism is that what they would actually be setting up is freedom for corporations from any sort of government over them. And it would eventually just become businesses that would compete, swallow up each other, become large corporations. It would be corporate totalitarianism. Because you would eventually have to have somebody setting the rules. Yeah. So, Actually, so fairly quickly, bring, have somebody say bring it back to the, <laughs> yeah, the, the unipolarity and then to the uh, the current situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here. But anyway, the American military, when they came into Italy, destroyed the society that these libertarian socialists had set up and gave it back to the power of the Italian state as part of their invasion. So they weren't just driving out the Nazis. They were on the side getting rid of the libertarian socialists in Northern Italy. So 
these two great powers that have, have both showed that they weren't interested in actual liberty movements, that they were interested in aggrandizing more power, after they had beaten the Germans, who were certainly no better and wanted power and had just committed mass genocide, they become the two dominant powers in the world. And everybody basically has to align with them. China even aligns with Russia, although still then, as today, they're, they, Russia and China and China and the Soviet Union, etc., are frenemies and pretty much always have been. So the, the, you now have these two dominant powers. So what you have is a bipolar world. Out of the ashes of World War I and World War II, you get a bipolar world, the Soviets and the Americans, and they both try to grow their own empire. They both do intrigues. They both overthrow countries in violent revolutions. They have proxy wars with each other, like Korea and Vietnam. And they, Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and Central America. Uh, and so you have these proxy wars going on. You have this, this what's called the Cold War set in. You have the Iron Curtain, what we call it at least. They probably saw it the opposite. But... The Smooth yeah. Curtain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The beautiful veil. Curtain. <laughs> the, the, the terrible veil or the glorious veil. The glorious veil, yes. The people's veil. Uh, people's <laughs> Republic glorious. Democratic people's. Veil. Yes. Like the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea. Uh, so you had these two giant superpowers who are fighting for control of the earth, who are alternately setting up supposedly capitalist and supposedly communist states around the world, fighting with each other, and everybody basically has to ally with one of these two. Um, now, some countries tried to get along with both, of course, but you pretty much had this division between the two, and even the countries who were trying to side with both, you, they still felt the tension. And France and England and, and the EU have basically aligned themselves with America. And that's pretty important because they stayed allied with America. So after communism fell and the Soviet Union fell apart, a lot of the countries in Europe eventually sided with America and joined NATO. Now, why did NATO still exist? That's a very good question. NATO shouldn't have continued to exist after 1991 or 92. There's that great line from Reagan, although I do not like him, that <laughs> the closest thing to eternal life on, on Earth is a temporary government program. <laughs> yep. We're from the government and we're here to help. Don't worry, we'll take this away in a few years. Or a few hundred. Yeah. NATO was supposed to, to be against... Um, I'm glad you share my dislike of, of Reagan, by the way. A lot of people seem to like think he was a great guy. Well, I'm a proud Californian, so I appreciate that he's an actor because it's it's worthy of the office of the presidency that there's an actor there. Um, same with Tricky Dick, right? Yeah. So, so the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was made to kind of curb communism. And when communism falls in its oh, yeah. main power, when there's a vacuum of power, it doesn't just uh, disband and say, hey, we won. Right. It was supposed to curb the Soviet Union to say, hey, um, if you, you can't just take one of our countries. So they were afraid that what the Soviet Union would do would be to expand their power 
by simply taking one Western country at a time. Here's a weak little country, we'll take it. Here's another one, we'll take it. And just kind of spread out like that. Especially a concern for France, where France has, it has never really had communists or the far left in charge, but has always had a far left faction. And, um, which, I mean, the Communist Party in France was very quickly taken over by the Bolsheviks and was controlled from Moscow. It became a puppet of the, of the Soviet state. And the American Communist Party was no better. Um, it, it got way corrupted and, and involved in state communism and state socialism. Yeah, I don't know the full extent of it. I know Michael Malice is working on a book that's going to be unveiling a lot of it. I've heard Curtis Yarvin speak a lot on the subject, but I've heard, um, if anything, McCarthy's issue was not, you know, going on a witch trial or witch hunt when there are no witches, but that he underestimated how many witches and how level, how high level the witches were. Oh, dear. <laughs> that 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 there were very high levels of communist infiltration hmm. and sympathizing in the in regime the, not just yeah. official card carrying members of the communist party but fellow hmm. travelers all over the place hmm. Hmm. that's interesting well the um The USSR actually at one time asked to join NATO because their thought was <laughs> <laughs> if they let us join, then we've lowered some of the tensions and there's going to be an alliance. If they don't let us join, then it's obvious that this is an anti Soviet organization. And we can feel free to set up our own military uh, agreement, alliance. alliance, which they did with the Warsaw Pact. And when, um, so this bipolar world continued from about 1945 to about 1991. Communism collapses. Unipolar world starts setting in. Some of the old communist bloc countries join NATO. Poland, of all places, joins NATO. Um, in 2008, the Baltic states are subsumed into NATO. Why on earth is NATO spreading right up to Russia's doorstep like this? You have to look at it from the Russian side. They're being backed into a corner by this military alliance that existed to curb a country that doesn't exist anymore. Of course they feel threatened. So just like at the turn at, at that one juncture at the end of World War II and the other at the juncture in World War I, you see the emergence of these libertarian movements. In 1994, you see another libertarian movement taking control of an area. So what happened is uh, the North American Free Trade Association, NAFTA, terrible organization basically gives power for american corporations to own water rights in mexico so it gives power for corporations to own basic human rights in poorer countries and take those resources for use in their products like coca-cola Yep, spreads the so-called IP or intellectual property apparatus, yep. which holds back a lot of innovation, counterintuitive as it may be. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's exactly what it's for. It's, it sounds nice, but it actually hurts the indigenous peoples and it hurts the poor and it keeps countries in poverty. So the the people in Chiapas in Mexico, in southern Mexico, who had long been relegated just as a backwater of the Mexican state, in spite of the fact that they have one third of Mexico's water resources, 
a lot of them recognized what was going down. And that basically they were about to become even poorer where they were on the brink of starvation and have all their water rights taken away and stolen from them. So on the very day in January 1994, when NAFTA went into effect, that very same day, the Zapatistas, the Liberation Army of the of the um, people of Chiapas, which is a libertarian socialist army, took over, just started taking over villages and towns and cities. They took over large swaths of Chiapas. They now control most of northern Chiapas. They had fighting off and on with the Mexican government for quite a few years until the Mexican government said, okay, you guys can have your autonomy and do whatever you want to do. The Mexican military and police still harass them sometimes, but they're not allowed in. And so the Zapatistas are um, an, an example of a an actual independent, successful libertarian movement. Now, granted, they probably didn't go up as against as good an army as the Italian anarchists or the Spanish anarchists or, were going up against. But they won. They basically won, and they have set up autonomous control of that area. They abolished private land ownership, so now you have communal land ownership, communal farms, no one is homeless. No one is starving to death. There's shared resources. They're in control of their resources, a lot of which is things like water and coffee. Is that to this day, by the way? I remember hearing about them as a kid, but... To this day. Wow. They're still in control of that area. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're still around. And they, they have established their own society. They've established their own education systems and their own schools. They don't teach the same things as in the neoliberal state-run Mexican schools. That's crazy. It, it proves the Machiavellian point again. It was their military prowess that, that preserved them. Mm -hmm. They won. <laughs> and they still have a military. Now, they have an armed forces. If you're serving in the Zapatistas in the Liberation Army, you cannot at the same time take part in the governing of the region. So you can't be in the military and the government at the same time. They've separated those two. It's not run by a state. There's no state. It's run by workers' councils. So it's an actual libertarian socialist community. Some of these numbers are a little old, but these are numbers that I found. In 2005, 84.2% .2 of Zapatista children were fully vaccinated, while that figure stood at 74.8% in pro-government communities. In 2010, 63% of all expectant mothers were able to receive medical assistance in Zapatista communities, while only 35% of pregnancies were properly assisted in non-Zapatista communities. In 2010, 74% of Zapatista communities had access to toilet facilities in their homes. 54% of pro-government communities had access to toilet facilities in their homes. In 2013, 32% of Zapatista inhabitants suffered from tuberculosis, while larger portions of pro-government communities, as like pro-government communities in Chiapas, 84% continued to experience tuberculosis. The eradication. Any... Oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, um, I was the eradication... ask a religious question. So go oh, ahead. Oh, sorry. Please. Yeah. <laughs> the eradication of both the manufacture and consumption of alcohol has led to the reduction of many illnesses and infections, including ulcers, cirrhosis, malnutrition, and surgical wounds. I was going to ask is it a sort of neo pagan nationalistic religious scenario or? Is, is there, are they Pentecostal? Are they Catholic? Like, 
I have no sense as to what sort of religion these people have. So it's interesting, and this is where I'd say uh, one point where they're better than the than the Spanish anarchists is they're uh, as far as I've been able to to determine from my research, there appears to be genuine just religious freedom. There's Catholic churches there. Uh, there apparently are a few people there who have converted to Islam. Uh, there are some people who want to go back to the old um the old gods yeah the old gods the old pre-columbian religion um so there appears to be uh, and i have heard that there are some more pentecostal and protestant churches there as well so there appears to be some genuine religious freedom and freedom of expression in that way that that's a, fa a fascinating case um i don't have a a ton of time left, but we do have some time left. Could could we bring it up to speed then from the Zapatistas to what's going on yeah. with Russia and the Ukraine today and then close on what you'd say the relevance of this is for the Miaphysite or Afro-Asiatic Christians? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me try to, um, to close that out real quick. So we've had a unipolar world for 30 years. We've had a world that has been dominated by the United States uh, for, since the time I was 10, I've seen us go into one nation after another, bomb them, destroy their governments, kill a bunch of civilians, torture people, and then leave them worse off than they were when we started, all in the name of freedom. So I have, since I was a child, not had a very high view of this American imperialism. Um, I, I think that what we're doing is wicked and our unipolar control of the world that uh, we have a lot of allies with, uh, such as Israel and European Union and some of our puppet states in Latin America, um, it's not headed in a good direction. Having one country that's so dominating over the entire earth and forcing its way on everyone else is not helpful because the more power a state gets, the more it will take. A state is not going to stop and say, hey, you know what? Let me curb my power back a little ways. I think I went too far. They're going to keep going, keep going, keep going. So I'm not supporting the existence of states necessarily when I say this, but having more than one state that can counterbalance the power of other states is a good thing. Can it be dangerous? Can there be friction? Can there be wars? Yes. But it is better, it is good comparative to having one state that just keeps getting more and more and more power. If I may interject, maybe uh, in terms of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is you prefer nationalism over what its opponents would call globalism or its proponents would call internationalism. And I put all that in, in scare quotes, but you would mm -hmm. prefer localism or regionalism above nationalism. Is that fair? In that kind of order of scale? Yeah, localism or, or regionalism. Now, okay, what I would prefer to see is a bunch of little regions like the Zapatista community. And that are run like that. That would be like my ideal world. Is even break down China and Russia and America into little pieces. And, and just have us be regionally based. Have San Diego County be its own country. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but I think that a... Some people like a, a patchwork system mm -hmm. is that is there another name for it that you're familiar i'm not sure but yeah some sort of of patchwork of communities that have actual free trade with each other not free trade of corporations that can exploit people in other areas and take away water and food rights and resource rights 
Um, everyone should be in control of their own resources, of their own local resources. And the local communities should have 100% say in what happens to their local resources. Uh, corporations and nation states should not have any say. Uh, really shouldn't even exist, in my opinion, in my viewpoint. So, um, but I, I certainly think like a multipolar world is where we're headed. And I think that that's going to be better than a unipolar world. I'm not saying that it is going to be ideal or that it's going to be all roses or no wars or whatever. Um, but I do think that it's going to be better than the unipolar world we have where one nation is throwing its weight around and getting increasingly aggressive and increasingly dictatorial, sending the CIA and other groups in to mess with, with other countries' internal politics. But what you see happening today is Russia got backed up so far by NATO that it finally reacted. And I'm not, again, you know, I'm not justifying everything the Russian state has done. I'm not saying that they haven't done anything wrong. They probably have. It's a war. And armies commit atrocities during wartime. The American army, even though it was going and liberating people from the Nazis, committed atrocities. And uh, the the Russian in, invasion of Ukraine, what's interesting is you see all these old groups that used to exist in the Ukraine reemerging. So you have the people with Zelensky and the National Army and the people who are supporting him who are more just your basic Ukrainian nationalists. They're not really out-and-out -out Nazis. But allied with them are some out-and-out -out Nazis. Very difficult. Yeah, difficult for Zelensky and part of Zelensky's argument being that he's Jewish to be a Nazi. Right, exactly. That's, that's his argument for there being a not significant amount of Nazis. Is I'm Jewish, how could I ally with Nazis? Right. And yet, even though he is Jewish... He is militarily allying with Nazis. <laughs> and that seems like kind of a, I don't know what's going on there kind of thing, but uh, the, the Azov Battalion is neo-Nazi. And until February of this year, the Western media was very willing to admit that and was very willing to say, we have a big problem. But now, because all the propaganda has to switch over to Russia is 100% bad and Ukraine is 100% good, which is silliness, now they're trying to whitewash it and code over it. Even though a lot of the, of the Azov people and a lot of the Ukrainian military who have been captured by the Russians have swastikas and tattoos of Adolf Hitler on them. So they're obviously... Yeah, so this, so this reaction by the bear mm -hmm. that the eagle doesn't like mm -hmm. is a reassertion of the multipolar order. And now yes. people say that the, um, what is the other one? It's the, the dragon. The is, dragon, uh, yes. Salivating. <laughs> the dragon is Taiwan. like, yeah, for Taiwan, for the Solomon Islands, they're trying to align themselves with Solomon Islands. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, America and Australia are all upset about that. Um, because China is trying to spread its power. I don't know what in the world the Philippines is doing. They just elected the son of the dictator Marcos to be their president. I don't know what they're doing or if they know what they're doing. I, I have a hot take here, which is that we talked about the troops being in Germany and in um, Japan. Mm-hmm. I think some very interesting things would happen if American troops pulled out of Germany and Japan. I don't know so much about Germany, but I have a deep-seated belief in Japan. And I feel like they are a very unique culture. And I feel like as the multipolar world was reasserting of itself, if America wanted a real kind of uh, hedging of the dragon, they would unleash the other dragon in Japan by just just <laughs> getting their troops out and say, "Hey, Japan, do, do what, what you do." Want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're and behind like, you. Are you sure? 
<laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure you want that? <laughs> That's exactly what they should do. If they really wanted to... But, you see, America is so drunk with power, I don't think they realize... I, I don't think the American government realizes because so drunk on power that they keep doing things that are ultimately detrimental to American hegemony in the world. That's good. Um, so, so to bring it back so we can really um, um, yeah. close up, so with, do you think the relevance of multipolarity is that in allowing more local and regional and communal control that the Miaphysite or Afroasiatic believers or other believers in that matter can do more good for the poor is that your your view i would say i'm hopeful that i'm hopeful we can head in that direction i don't see multipolarity as an end so much as a breaking of american hegemony that we could then use to have those local movements reassert themselves um and and maybe that could bring some peace if now people have to be willing like what's going on in ethiopia right now isn't very encouraging or everybody's breaking down on tribal lines but if we could have some sort of peace there yeah it seems like they're negotiating there's a lot of um propaganda going around so it's it's difficult in the diaspora to tell but it does look like the government of ethiopia is negotiating with the terrorist rebels who have control of their a smaller version of what used to be their regional state so yeah i, I pray for peace there as well it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a strange situation i was telling you kind of off camera you know we have some churches in the diaspora who because they have an ethnic political allegiance are calling the patriarch's name but the patriarch is the patriarch of the whole church especially oh, yeah. now that we don't have two co-reigning but one single patriarch but they don't want to call their local bishops because they're of a different ethnicity and it's it's really ridiculous that is that is it's insane man because like what i'm not the same ethnicity as most of my church <laughs> yeah like i guess it, it's the fact that the ethnicity lines up with the politics or you could say the the tribalism it's really a pseudo ethnicity i don't even think it's a, a real ethnicity it's it's more linguistic difference and i don't view the the language as different enough because there are enough bilingual people of that the region where my family is from um one particular region 50 percent are bilingual in this language and in amharic another area that my family is from it's 80 percent and so oh, it's no. uh you know the language thing is it's ridiculous this is a divider now yeah. well you know here's the thing like i'm not against those regions each of those regions maybe even along linguistic lines ruling themselves and having you know regional workers councils in control of the areas but as long as they recognize that they need to stop looking at another ethnicity and another people and saying they're our enemies let alone bringing that into the church that's where it becomes pretty dangerous and um super i mean and they they bombed across international lines like they bombed the other regions of ethiopia and they bombed the capital city of eritrea so they they really made it involved and made it an international matter and have talked even of kind of like busting through djibouti to get to the red sea and you know <laughs> really involving the entire <laughs> horn of africa but um th this has been a great discussion i think a great overview a survey of the topic of polarity and its multi bi and mono or uni versions have you at the polish miaphysite blog which we plugged the last time and i want you to plug again right now have you ever written about anything like this on polarity or is it is it just been um more purely religious ideas and so talk about that and 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 send them to the the polish miaphysite yeah i so my my blog is polish .com, and you can just look up polish miaphysite on google and it should come up with my youtube channel and my uh website i have how do you spell miaphysite m-i-a-p-h-y-s-i-t-e 
Thank you. Out the site. So I I have um can, I have not written specifically on this, but I have considered writing and may write on the social implications of myophysite Christology. Um, because I I do believe that, for example, the struggle of the Zapatistas on the Mexican side and just a few miles over on the Guatemalan other side of the Guatemalan border, the Mayans over there converting en masse to Oriental Orthodoxy, I do think that they have very similar uh implications yeah i would i would if, whether that's an article or a book really you could have a book where it's like a chapter on either a failure or a success and mm -hmm. comparing them man i would i would love reading that and obviously we would have you back on to uh, deep dive on it and encourage the audience to get a hand of it mm -hmm. or, or a hold of it themselves whichever way you decide to pursue it whether it's just on your blog or whether it becomes a, a book one day, I'm excited to see how these thoughts evolved. And thank you again so much, Daniel, for coming on again to the program to to mix it. it. It takes a little bit of audaciousness, like you said in the beginning, because you had some trepidation of of mixing these these topics. Right, the mm -hmm. two topics you're not supposed to bring up at a gala are politics and religion, and those are just the best topics so those are like the ones i like talking about the most so i'm glad you do too and and thank you for joining me this evening my pleasure thank you for having me <laughs>